a short line that I hardly visit? Let's change that today. Welcome back to the Sunshine State Rails, and happy National Train Day. The national holiday for me this year would be spent down south in the Florida cane fields on another visit to the U.S. Sugar Short Line Railroad. With some newfound interest upon our visit here a couple weeks ago, I'd make the long sought trip back down here to try and catch whatever I could upon these rails before harvest season ended, which I knew was about to be very soon because we are into May now. But before we even made it to Clewiston, across the freshly harvested cane fields, a train would appear coming north. So I turned off the main road onto a dirt road that led down to the tracks, although I held off, realizing that I couldn't make it down to the tracks in time, though the dash cam would catch our train off in the distance. I didn't know what train this was or where he was going, but I knew he had empty cars and that he had to pick up loads somewhere. So wherever he was going, we were going to give chase. Turning around and rushing to the best of our ability back up State Route 720, the northernmost crossing would catch us with bells, lights, and gates for our string of empties racing north. A bit closer up this time, but also kind of rushed to where the shot out the window was mediocre at best. With a solo Jeep 11 in charge, this string of empties would be headed north to a sugarcane loadout somewhere, but like I said, I didn't know where that was, and heading north, storm clouds were brewing. Though we'd get a bit further before any of that affected us, and Moorhaven, just a couple of miles north, is where we'd set up next, as the train would notch back out of their speed restriction across the Caloosahatchee River swing bridge. <laughs> The next shot of our train wouldn't come until State Road 70, almost to Placid Lakes. Like I said before, I didn't know what sugarcane loadout that the train was going to go to, so I checked almost every single one on our way north, costing us valuable time. But a couple of minutes wait at State Road 70, now north of the thunderstorm, would reveal the LED headlights northbound momentarily. Confirming what I had initially predicted, that the train was going to the northernmost loadout on the system, under the name Childs. <laughs> For the first and only time today, the sun has come out, as our train is a quarter mile away from their destination, the Child's Elevator. As we head right up the road to said location, an empty sugarcane truck passes us on Old State Road 8, and in our 7-ish minute wait at State Road 70 for the train, we must have had 7 or 8 of these trucks pass us there. And this sugarcane loadout is exactly the reason for that. At the north end, the train stops to drop the conductor off the switch, and then the engineer takes the train ahead. They're gonna have to pull these empties north of this switch, and then shove them into the loadout's tracks.
Find ND Road down, clear for 27, out of my way. And then, back it all up. The cane elevator here at Childs is arguably one of the most interesting on U.S. Sugar, as A, it's the northernmost loadout on the entirety of their system, and B, unlike those further south or closer to Clewiston, this one's not out in the middle of cane fields. In fact, this one's in the middle of citrus fields, nothing that U.S. Sugar hauls over its rails. So, as we'll momentarily see, that is why all of those sugarcane trucks are on the road. The cane is harvested elsewhere, and then these trucks bring it here to Childs and load up the cane cars. And when ready, a train comes out and brings the cars back to Clewiston and the mill there. Although when ready should not be taken with a grain of salt, this stuff is valuable and time sensitive. And the elevator at Childs gives us a first hand look into that, as a nearby hill and a drone in my back seat gives us a good vantage over all of this. Looking pretty rough on the outside, but on the inside it's all pretty streamlined. These trucks, with trailers blocked off in sets of three, bring in the harvested sugarcane. They dump it onto this elevator which literally lifts the sugarcane up and into the cane cars. An operator in a watchtower controls and watches everything as it goes. What's more is that these elevators don't need an engine to move the cars underneath the elevator. A specially built wire cable system moves the cars below under command of the man in the watchtower. Drivers of the sugarcane trucks just pull up, dump, and go. They're in and out of the elevator in about five minutes. The chain of cane trucks is unbroken as our conductor walks over to add the end of train device to what is about to be our southbound loaded train. This is why empties for the elevator must be shoved in at the north end. It makes everything easier, especially since this facility is on a grade, which allows empty cars at the north end to roll down the hill into the elevator when ready, and loaded cars to be pulled out of the south end. Although empty cars at the north end don't just roll down to the elevator, as we'll see here, another cable is attached to a construction vehicle which pulls the empties that are ready down to where the other empties under the elevator are. And although it's not necessary, I'm sure the downhill grade just helps that whole process go along a bit smoother. And that's a fairly simplified look of how operations happen here at the Child's Elevator. And it all has to go this smoothly because, as I said before, the stuff in these cars is valuable and time sensitive. I've read different things in different places, but I've come to the conclusion that sugarcane after it's been harvested will have spoiled within no more than 24 hours. What that means is, if this stuff after it's been cut is not to the mill within a day, it is all but useless. So, this ain't like CSX, where freight can sit somewhere for an untold period of time until a train crew is ready to come get it. This load has a very finite time limit. And so, when they're loaded, these cars can't sit idle for very long. They have to be on the move, stat. The stuff that's in them, and thereby the company pulling it all, depends on it. So, with all that said, we've got no time to waste. Our crew has already pulled their loaded cars out of the south end of the loadout, and after a quick train inspection, they're ready to pull the trigger and fire it all to Clewiston. Starting off, back across State Road 70.
nearing the end of harvest season, the line would be clear almost all the way. And that cane won't get itself to the mill, so our loaded train screams south along Old State Road 8. Rainstorms that had built up in the early morning hours were still hanging out over the town of Palmdale. Coming into the outskirts of said town, the windshield wipers would be in full swing as we'd go headlong with a downpour coming into the city limits. And as we backed into our next private road location, part of me hoped it would stay heavy as it would make for a very interesting shot, although such wouldn't be the case, and the rains would reduce to a sprinkle by the time the train made it to us. Now rolling through Palmdale, the drizzle would continue, but even so, I'd take the opportunity for more pacing shots along this stretch, as it isn't often you get to run side by side with one of these Paducah, Kentucky rebuilds, such as this low nose GP11. Eighteen miles further and our train inches back through Moorhaven, across the Caloosahatchee River beneath the palm trees. But another two miles south and our train has come to a dead stop on the main, just short of the State Route 720 crossing from this morning. The radio wasn't telling me any specifics as to why, but I had a pretty good idea as to why, because there's not many other reasons for this. And turning back to the south, my suspicions were confirmed. An empty cane job was coming north out of Clewiston, and they were to drop some empty cars in a loadout just south of us here before continuing north, and they'd have to meet our cane job just ahead of us. And how they would do this would be a very interesting maneuver, aided by their short line and non-signaled status, which gives them the ability to bend the rules, shall we say.
Once this train got out of the way of our southbound loads, they would continue up the line northward, and while I don't know for sure, judging by the speed of which they were loading cars up there, I bet you 90 bucks that this train was also going to the child's elevator to pick up loaded cars up there and possibly the empty cars we dropped off this morning. I bet you just as much that those cars have already been loaded as well. What we couldn't see from the shots earlier was that our loaded train had stopped just short of a branching switch, that which this empty train is now using to branch off of the main line towards an industrial park. The leftward branching track actually does a U-turn and comes back across State Route 720 to loop into a set of industries. They would literally use this long industrial spur to pull the empty train off of the main, allow our loaded train to come south before the empties backed back onto the main and continued north from there. Something you don't see everywhere. But again, the load in these cars is precious and time sensitive, so anything and everything that they can do to be as time efficient as possible will be done, especially here since they have the flexibility to do so. And with that said, there is still no time to waste, so our loads are getting back up to speed. Loads were back on the move again, but only for so long. The loadout that that empty train just dropped cars at, this train had to pick up cars from. They're also having quite a bit of cane load out here. And so, to save another crew, train, and trip, these guys are going to pick up the loads from this loadout that are ready to go now. Because again, the load is time sensitive. Which will explain the extra length to our train as he passes us here in the middle of the fields as the storms seem to chase us southward. Closing in on Cluiston, the train would beat us to the second SR-720 crossing, but not quite the one on US-27, which we'd arrive to with gates lowering. So, another shot out the window, eh? Coming into the Cluiston residence, we set up at U.S. Sugar's North Shops, a locomotive servicing facility, locomotive and local train staging yard, and the railroad's crew office.
Now past the north shops, our train's gonna make a quick swing to the south and then back to the west, so they can pull the train all in here. Their decent sized yard at their Clewiston Sugar Refinery. When a loaded train arrives at the mill, the crew's only job is to pull the consist in, leave it on one of the yard tracks, and then take the engine back elsewhere. The yard crew with the remote control will then take over, pulling each cut out of the yard tracks when ready. Using remote yard switcher number 204, they'll then shove all of the cars through the unloader and all of the sugarcane will be dumped into the mill. This is when the sugar refining process begins. Once the sugarcane is in the mill, it'll go through a series of large rollers which will squeeze out all of those sugary juices from the cane. The extracted juice is then clarified to remove soil and other impurities. This juice which is then concentrated into a syrup by boiling off excess water, seeded with raw sugar crystals in a vacuum pan and then boiled until the sugar crystals have formed and grown. This sugar, in whatever form they put it into, will then make its way into 75% or more of the processed foods made in America. And this is how the sugar industry is so profitable. Think of it this way, next time you eat something out of a box, look at the back of that box. Under the nutrition facts, every gram of sugar that you see in that product is making this company or others like it a lot of money. Our crew has brought their loaded train into the yard, dropped it off, and are now bringing their engine back up around to the north shops to leave it as their work is done for the day. They debrief at the crew office and probably get in their cars and head home, and with their work done, Ours was done too. And so, we'd turn the wheels back north and start making the trip home. And I can't say, as the sun finally comes out for the second time today, that this was all that bad of a way to spend National Train Day 2022. It was good to get back onto the US Sugar Rails, and I hope to do it again pretty soon. I thank y'all for joining me on this one, and until next time, wherever we choose to go, this is Coda Beaner, and I'll see you out there somewhere upon the Sunshine State Rails.